I'd like to speak to you uh, for a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> there was something I read uh, in Scripture that has stuck with me for days. It was uh, a word, the words, if I and if my. If I and if my. Uh, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Second Chronicles, please? Um, the seventh chapter. This is a very familiar scripture. Yeah, in our in our Bible reading uh, that Shannon led us in, it it has scripture that really goes with what I would like to talk about today. And uh, when it talked about humility, though the Lord is high, yet he regards the lowly or the humble, but the proud he knows far off. So I, what I'd like to speak to you today and maybe share with you and get <clears throat> is uh, if the Lord says, if I, and then we'll, we'll see a list of things that he says, if, if I do these things, then we can see a, a response, if my. And you, you know what that is, but I'd like to look at the first the things that the Lord said, if I do these things, and though, so if my people, in other words, would become aware of these things that I'm doing, then there should be a response. Then my people, if they do this, then God says, then I will do this. So if, you, if, you, if it was a fill in the blank, so to speak, let's see, if, if, let's see God's part and then let's look at our part to see if we're doing the part, our part. There is a God's part, which we cannot do, but there is a part we can do. Only God can do that part that he alone is sovereign over and is willing to do. God in his mercy is willing to do these things. And if God is in his mercy is willing to do this, then we as his people have a response. We, it, it could, because uh, when I speak this this morning, I'm speaking, uh, of course, this, this word goes to all, lost and saved. But God says, if my, okay, there is a responsibility of God's people. You and I have a responsibility to respond at the movings of God. It's been that way all through history, whether or not we will respond. Now, to give you a, a, a thought of what, uh, this is a dedication of the temple in Second Chronicles chapter 7. There has just been one of the greatest Passover meetings uh, ever had. Uh, this great dedication, Solomon is on a scaffold with his hands raised up, and he's praying this long, long prayer to the Lord. You can read it in chapter 6. Uh, of, And you know, this dedication... Uh, it was amazing. I was reading. There were 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep dedicated. Just from what I can, I, I was, Shannon would know more about it than me, but I think it takes 15,000 acres of land just to pasture 120,000 sheep. That's a number we can't even, I can't even comprehend that were dedicated and offered during this time of dedication. It was, a, it was an unprecedented time in, the, in, in God's people, in the history of God's people. And when Solomon had, had taken over and built this temple that his father had saved for and planned for for years, now it had all come to fruition. And, and Solomon is making this great dedication and this, the people are all gathered in... Uh, and so, let's look uh, at, at, at uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, starting at verse 1. When Solomon had finished praying 
fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Wouldn't that be a, an amazing sight to, to experience where you couldn't even enter in? I'd heard of, of some uh, worship times where the glory of the Lord was so powerful that people couldn't even get off of the floor. They were down on the floor and they just literally couldn't, couldn't get up. Can you imagine the presence of the Lord coming in such a powerful way? And I, I, I think of all these sacrifices because in chapter 6, it said that all of the, the brass things and the things that Solomon had made, he couldn't even hold it all. You had 120,000 sheep alone, 22,000 oxen, and the, the fire of the Lord comes down and consumes it. Boom. This, this is an incredible thing that has happened. And notice verse 3, it says, When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground in the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, his mercy endures forever. I, don't, I can't see how anybody could be standing after that, do you? How could you stand? We would have to just bow and say, The Lord is good, his mercy endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord, and King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God, and the priests attended to their services, and the Levites also with the instruments of music of the Lord, which King David had made to praise the Lord, saying, For his mercy endures forever. Whenever David offered praise by their ministry, the priests sounded trumpets opposite them while all Israel stood. Furthermore, Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was in the front of the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat. Can you imagine just the fat of all that? It's just hard to believe. Just, just that massive amount. At that time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him a very great assembly from the entrance to Hamath to the brook of Egypt. Now, I want to skip down to the part that I guess everybody knows and read this. Verse 12. Now, after all of this tremendous celebration and offering and the Lord's presence being so strong, the Lord appears to Solomon by night. And he said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Now, when the Lord speaks in verse 13 and 14, he's, he's repeating what Solomon has already prayed. In in chapter 6, Solomon said this, Lord, if you, if you shut up heaven, there be no rain. If you, if you do this, if you're... Now, this has literally happened. There are some people that this literally happened to. I mean, you think of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of Daniel when he was in captivity, how he would open his windows three times and put his face toward Jerusalem and pray. But, but Jerusalem, and when we think of praying and seeking the Lord and turning our face, we don't know where, <laughs> I don't know which way Jerusalem is. And, and I got to thinking, Lord, this temple's gone. But even when Jonah was in the belly of the whale, he said, I turned my face toward Jerusalem. So he doesn't know which direction, he's in a whale's belly. He don't know which way to turn, so it's not really a, a turning of the body as it is of the heart. Does that make sense? When, when, when something God is saying, when, when I do something, there has to be a heart issue. There has to be a movement or a turning of the heart in a certain direction, you see. And the things that were given that God said I'll do, the first one is, if I shut up heaven and there's no rain. It's not been too easy for us to comprehend that because we've had the most wet year 
I told Joel, I said, their faith, I've worked in the mud all year long. It's been mud, 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 mud. But when I got to looking, there is a uh, drought meter. And when you look at the United States and the drought meter, that it goes from D0, D1, D2, D3, D4, being D3 and 4 being extreme and D4 being exceptionally drought. It, when you look at the map now, the whole left side of America is either extreme or exceptionally in drought. So we can't judge it by what we're seeing here. And also we have to remember, the Lord says, I caused it to rain in one place, but not in another. If I, if I shut up heaven and there's no rain, all right, that's one if, or command the locusts to devour the land. Now, we haven't seen, I haven't seen locusts. <laughs> I've seen the most Joro spiders I've ever seen in my life. Those things drive me nuts. But I've, is it, when you look down the road and you look up in the power lines and you just see web after the web after web, it's just amazing. But I thought of the pestilence. I thought of the the devouring of the land with the word devour, how it means, and how there are things that are devouring our land, people. There are things that are devouring the goodness of the land. There is corruption that is devouring our land. Do you believe, do you agree with me? There, there, there's, there's a devouring of the land that we're, that we love. There's a devouring of things that are good and things that are right and things that are true. And we're seeing that happen if, if, and then he says, or send pestilence among my people. The word pestilence is or the word deber, D-E-B-E-R. And it means in the sense of destroying a murin, a plague. But this is what inter was interesting to me. Well, in other words, the Lord says, if I send a plague, <clears throat> we've all seen this. We've seen uh, what we've gone through as a nation and still are in. I've never s thought I'd see in my life uh, of what we've seen with the COVID. And what we got to do as God's people I don't care if you think it was made in a laboratory in China or not. God said, if I send it, we have to think that way. As God's people, you and I, don't, we, we have to, you, you, we, we shouldn't be the ones that are complaining and growling and moaning and groaning how somebody else could do. God said, if I send this, if I send it. Well, you said, how could God send such a thing? I don't know. God says, if I do, then I expect, I'm, I, if I do, then there's a response that should, should be, right? God's people should respond. How do we respond to this? How do we respond to this plague? Here's what really shocked me. The word deber is, is a, comes from the root word dabar, which means to arrange a figuratively the words. It means to speak to declare. So it what, tell, what tells me that God says, when I am sending a plague, I'm speaking. I'm declaring something. That's what it means. It, what, when God is, when he speaks, I speak this way at times. I know he speaks in, in ways that he only can, but God says, if I choose to speak in a drought, if I choose to speak with a plague, then there's something you can do if, 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 I, if I speak this way. And it's, it's undebatable, God is speaking. It's been over a year. And, there's some, he's, and, and, and I think as a response, you know, there used to be an old commercial on television years ago that was, it was the E.F. Hutton commercial, you remember? 
when somebody would say and everything got really quiet and people would turn, you know? Probably don't remember that. <laughs> but but uh, Sam says, no, I don't remember that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there's a quietness which fall over, a hush over the room, and people would say, wait a minute, so I, I need to listen. What it was saying, when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens is what the gist of it was. So we would say when God speaks this way, his people ought to listen, right? We can all agree with that. So the first thing that the Lord says, if I do these things, if I shut up heaven, we've seen that, that's, that's happened. Command the locusts, we've seen the land, we've seen our land being devoured. And that may, we don't know what's ahead. We've seen pestilence. We've seen the plague. That's what it means, plague. Look it up. That's what it means, a plague. In fact, uh, just to give you a a picture, uh, when David numbered the people, it was a pride issue. Joab, his general, said, David, you don't need to do this. You know how many you got. And it was a pride thing. You know, we, we, we have this many soldiers. We have this many men of war. We have this. It was a thing to look at and be proud of. And Joab said, don't do it. Well, David said, yeah, I want to do it. They took a census and took a number. And when it was brought, it brought uh, judgment of, of the Lord. And he gave you three things. You pick. And David said, well, I can't remember the three. One of them was the enemy coming in. Well, one of them was... Uh, maybe a plague because David said well let me fall into the hands of the Lord because his mercies are great don't let me fall in the hand of the enemy so I choose fall and so a plague broke out and I, I want to say 7,000 it was in the thousands of people died and the Bible said that the, the, there was a vision they, the, of the angel of the Lord with the sword over Jerusalem and there was a sacrifice made before he took the Lord stopped. He stopped. He said, stop, stop. And I thought, I, I was talking to my brother one day, and I said, when, when we were thinking about COVID, and we, I, said, I said, I wonder if there's an angel over our nation. You know, we can't see him. I, I, maybe I'm distorted. My, but I thought that. Lord, is there, how, is there, is there, is that is, is, is his sword? Because the Lord told him to put up his sword. Is the sword out? If the Lord speaks in this way, then our, our okay, so we agree. Then verse 14. If I, we've seen the if I part. Now let's see if, the if my part. If my people who are called by my name, that's us, right? All right, number one, humble themselves. How do we do that? The word humble, kana, it means to bend the knee. It means hence to humiliate, to bring down, to bring low, to bring into subjection, to bring under, subdue. I've been reading a book on humility by Andrew Murray and it said this, the tricky thing about humility is once you think you have it, you've lost it again immediately. Isn't that true? And you think, I'm pretty humble. <laughs> no, you're not. If that, if that word comes out of your mouth, then it's an indication, no, you're not there. How do we have this? As the people of God, how do we do the first thing that God says to do if I do, if I speak in this way, if God is speaking, if God is speaking in the way of, of, of a, an epidemic, a pandemic, if all we do, and I've said this before, Lord, I wish it would be over with. Take it away. But if, if all we do is get through it and not, and not learn anything, if we've not responded in the way that God has said to respond, then we've lost it. 
We've lost it. We've, we've not learned a thing. If, if we don't respond as God's people, then we haven't learned a thing. Be like J.B. Wilkins told me when he was in World War II. And he said, uh, we'd be on a ship and the submarines would, would come and said, boy, oh, people, he'd be crying, oh, God, help me, God, help me, God. He said, I never heard such praying in my life. He said, but when the submarines were passed, there was just as much partying as there ever was when the danger was gone. And so it seems to be the way of human nature. When the danger is past, it's party time again. Back to our old ways. And I don't know what it will take to finally turn the heart. And, and may I remind you again, he says, if my people, my people, First thing if we do if we humble ourselves. Our Lord Jesus Christ is, is the perfect picture of humility. He took the place of entire subordination to God the Father. That's what Andrew Murray said in, in, in his book. We can do no less, right? If everything, and this is what, what, what I've been studying and reading what humility really is. Humility is not thinking bad of yourself or browbeating yourself or talk, because if you do that, you're just magnifying yourself. Your whole, your whole focus is on yourself. If it's all you talk about is how bad you are, you see, that's not humility. Humility really is not even thinking of yourself at all, but, but humility is, is focusing on who God really is. And when our focus is focused on Him, we automatically see who we are. Humility is really letting God be God and giving it all to Him, entire subordination to God the Father, submitting ourselves to Him. Our Lord Jesus lost nothing by giving all to God. God honored His trust and did all for him. Does that make sense? If you and I are tr truly humble, we give all to God and he does all for us. Isn't that a great picture? God is not out to hurt us and damage us. He wants to do all for us. In Luke chapter 18, verse 14, it's he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, I'm only going to... Now, he says, the complete verse says, if, there, if, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Every one of these things are linked together. Okay? Humility comes, prayer, because when, when real humility comes, we see our desperate need for prayer. We see our desperate need for God. It drives us to prayer. A person in genuine humility is, is not hard to pray because you see without him you can do nothing. You must pray continually to even exist, to function. That's why people without the Lord, they can't even function in society. There's no, there's no stability. There's no emotional stability because there have no, it's only by God's grace that you and I, I tell you the truth, if it wasn't for God's grace, I, can't, I could not function. If we'll humble ourselves, if we pray and seek his face, then it also says, turn from their wicked ways. If we didn't have any wicked ways, I doubt that he would put that in there. Right? So one's links to the other. The humility comes, the praying comes, the seeking of his face comes, and then a turning comes. Brother Chris mentioned this not long ago when, when Isaiah, but when we seek his face and we see him, 
the scripture said in Isaiah, when I saw the Lord high and lifted up, his train filled the temple. What were the next words? I said, woe is me. Something got exposed in him. And it, for Isaiah, that it was his mouth. It was his mouth. He, it, he, he, saw, he realized there was something unclean about his uh, behavior. And it was his tongue. I'm a man of unclean lips. I, I, and it, it come from a, a, a vision of the Lord. The Lord never said to him, Isaiah, you got to... It just, it was just seeing the presence of the Lord, just the awareness and the holiness and, 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 the, and the majesty of God exposed human frailty, see. And he said, woe is me. So we, so what will God do? And I'm just going to read some scripture. Will God change his mind? Is that possible? Well, it is. The Bible says so. It says over and over he repented or relented in some versions. He changed his mind. I wonder what, what is in mind for this nation if we don't do this. If we don't. We don't have to. We don't have to do it. I don't have to do it. I mean, you don't, you don't have to. It's, it's, a, it's a if, if we do. There's a result, though, if, if, we, if we choose to do it. This, is, I think, is an individual thing. I can't, I, I can't, I don't know sins of anybody. I don't know. But I think that Is there, there has to be an acknowledging of who God is and who we are. You know, it was incredible to me. I was with John the Baptist. Remember, the Bible said he came preaching the baptism of repentance. And, you know, some of the, some of the Pharisees came and he said, well, who told you to flee the wrath to come? And do you remember, though, uh, the soldiers came. And they said, what do we do? What do we do? Isn't that incredible how has this man come out of the wilderness, he's preaching repentance, and you've got a hardened Roman soldier that is so convicted, he's willing to get changed. What do I do? And John the Baptist is giving, you can read it. It was such a move, there's such a move in, amongst the people. These were heathen people. They were not Christians. They were not Jews. These were guys that were soldiers. What do we do? That there was something in them that knew this was God. It was a move of God. To, to move them to, Jesus even made this statement. He said, the queen of the north will, will come. He was talking about the queen of Sheba. She came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And Jesus said, behold, a greater than Solomon is here. She'll rise up in judgment with this generation. And I think, Lord, what about our generation? Will the, will the, will the judgment, will, will a generation prior to us who repented, who may be brought on great awakenings in this country, will it stand up against us and say, y'all had more light than we had, and we repented, but you didn't. I, I wondered, I don't know that, but I wonder if, is that possible? Could that happen? Could that happen to, if, if we don't respond in ways prior to this time that where there were great, great awakenings and the Lord used people, men and women, to stir up I wonder if we will have to stand and give a reckoning to the light that, that we have and that we may or may not respond to. I have a feeling that there will be a great response. There will be a great turning. I, I, I just believe there will. I believe God in his mercy, if I, if my. I believe we, if we do, it starts with me, one, one person, right? One person, just one will respond maybe, one. What will God do if a person humbles himself? What would be the result? 
of one person. I have some examples. I, I'm talking about some rough people. Go to 1 Kings chapter 16. First Kings 16, and then also 21. First Kings 16, look at verse 29. Verse 29, I'll read, I want to read a few verses there. It said, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. See that? More. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took his, as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, the king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him and set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria, and Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Worst, the worst. His wife was horrible. Like I heard one preacher said, if, if I saw them two on my counseling list, I'd leave. That's how bad it was. He did this terrible it even gets worse. Go over to chapter 21 of the, of the same, uh, I think it's 21. Yeah. We're in the same Ahab still king, him and Jezebel. Look at verse 1 of 21. It came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. Now, the, some versions say it's a vegetable garden. But either way, it's a vineyard. It was a, it was a garden spot, if you so to have it. And it was right next to the palace, and Ahab wanted it. So verse 2 says, Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden. There it is, in, is I guess, what he wanted to make out of it. My, my mistake. Because it is near next to my house, and I'll give you a vineyard better than it, or if it seems good to you, I'll give you its worth in the money. And Naboth said, no, I can't. It's my, my inheritance. And back then, you God forbid that you'd sell your family inheritance. He said, no, I won't do it. And I heard a preacher say this. You know what's a good exposure of your pride? What well, can tell you whether you've got pride or not? how you respond to no. <laughs> how you respond to no. It was, you could hear a pin drop. It's true, isn't it? When you respond to how the way you, it will expose your pride. It'll expose my pride. How I respond to no. Well, it did to Ahab. Ahab, look what he did. He pouted like a baby. Verse 4, he went to his house sullen, displeased, because, and he wouldn't even eat. He laid there. What a baby he was. And Jezebel said, what's the matter? And so he tells her the story, and Jezebel said, get, get up and eat. Verse 7, I'll give you the vineyard of Naboth. She wrote letters, and in other words, she plotted a murder. One of the most wicked, vile things, she plotted this man's murder. Naboth, the innocent man. And you know the story. She wrote letters, said, oh, just proclaim a fast. It was just a big lie. And they made out like Naboth had blasphemed. Like one preacher said, the day Naboth went out of his door, he thought he was going to a meeting or thought he was going to a celebration for himself, not realizing he was going to his death. And so she, the scoundrels came and they made the plan and they stoned him to death. And Ahab, get up, verse 16, when he heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth. No guilt whatsoever. He's a trashiest thing I've ever seen. Though, but here comes the word of the Lord. 
Elijah. Verse 18, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, thus says the Lord, have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs, where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I found you, because you've sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I'll bring calamity on you and will take away your posterity. I'll cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I'll make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. There is no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him. Now you think, like I heard of one preacher say on this, when he said, yeah, he gets the dogs and the birds. That's what he deserves. See? But look at verse 27. So it was when Ahab heard those words. Now Elijah is just telling him just exactly what we read. This is what you got coming. He tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his body, and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. Now look at this. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. You see that? You think it doesn't count for him. It only counts for a little bit good people. But Ahab humbled himself when he heard of the judgment that was pronounced on him and his household. He humbled himself. And he said, because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. That's incredible. How, how A man could get the mercy of God like that by humbling himself. How much more would God's people? Manasseh, 2 Kings 21. One of the, if, 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 if Ahab wasn't bad, you got Manasseh, who's just, you think, worse. He reigned for 55 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He had a good father, Hezekiah. He made his sons pass through the fire. He practiced soothsaying. He used witchcraft. He consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even did what we're standing for today in sanctity of life. He gave up his own children. Of anybody deserved judgment, it was Manasseh. The Bible said he shed more innocent blood than anyone that the Lord would not pardon. He put a carved image up. Now, but, but in 2 Chronicles 33, let me just read it if you don't want to turn there. The Lord spoke to Manasseh, and this is verse 10 of 33, Manasseh. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen or obey. Therefore the Lord brought them upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks. He bound him with bronze fetters and carried him off to Babylon. And now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and pray to him if my people which are hum which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face 
And he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Incredible, incredible act of mercy that God is willing. Josiah was another king who postponed judgment of God, postponed it because he sought God. If you read the story of Josiah, I don't understand how this could happen. The book of the law got lost. They found it in the temple of the Lord and begin to read it. And they begin to realize, wait a minute, this is happening to us because we disobeyed the Lord. And he tore his clothes and he got in sackcloth. Josiah did this. And the Lord said, Josiah, because you've humbled yourself, I won't bring it on in, in your time. I'll, I'll postpone it, in other words. God did that. He did that for that man. He said, you'll go to your grave in peace because you've humbled yourself just by hearing the word. That's all it took. Hearing the words of God and seeing, if I, Josiah heard God say, if I, and he recognized it, so he did, if I, he responded that way. You see, just by hearing the words of the Lord. It'll go to James chapter four, and I'll finish. I, I, I don't have I don't have the formula. I mean I I'm seeking this as much as as, as anybody. What, what this means. Verse one of chapter four, James says, "Where do wars and fights come from among among you? Do they not come from your, your desires or your lusts?" In the King James, I think it says, "Your lust for pleasure that war in your members." In other words, there's a warfare in our members that we. We have. We all have that. We all know what that's like. You lust, do not have. You murder, covet, cannot obtain. You fight in war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. And then Brother John talked on this Wednesday night. You ask and don't receive because you ask amiss. In other words, that you may spend it or consume it on your lust. Spend it on your pleasures. In other words, asking just to consume it. See, not asking. When Josiah prayed... He wasn't praying to consume it on his lust. He was praying for mercy. When Manasseh prayed, he was praying for mercy. When, when uh, Ahab prayed, it wasn't to consume it on their lust. He'd already been down that road. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Who's, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain? The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy or lusteth to envy, I think the King James says. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now listen to this. Nothing moves God quicker than pride. He hates it, right? Right? But on the other side, nothing moves God quicker than humility. Isn't that amazing? They both. They both. One, one preacher said it this way. Humility is the soft spot. If God has a soft spot in his heart, he responds to humility. But he also opposes. If you want to make God oppose you, have pride. If you want him to resist you, I don't want that. Lord, have mercy. I don't want God to resist me. Well, then be proud. And you'll get it. I will. Therefore, there, here, here it is again. Humility. Submit to God. Submit. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. I, there's a reason that next verse says that. Right after humility, l let me just say this. If I'm truly humble, I can't talk about you. You agree? If I have true humility... 
I will not talk about you evil. I won't backbite. I won't be a tail, tail bearer. It's a, it's a sign of pride. It, it puffs us up when we talk about others and try to make ourselves look better than what we really are. It's a form of pride. It's a form of pride. Don't speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a, of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver who's able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? You see, come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go such and such and such a city, spend there a year. And what is it? This whole focus of James is getting us back to what we said at the beginning. Being humble is letting God be who he is. And, and to us completely by submission to him. But the person who is proud and speaks evil of other people who's always planning, I'm going to do this tomorrow, I'm going to do that tomorrow, I'm going to do this, this is what we're going to do. Don't you realize your life is just a vapor? Verse 14, it appears for a little time and vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Now, I want to stop. I, I'm, I'm trying, I don't want, I ask the Lord to help me not to bring any condemnation to anybody. I, I'm not here for that. But the Lord says, I'll break the pride of your power. Man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. The Lord, when speaking to Job in chapter 40, the Lord said, look upon everyone that is proud and bring him low. God said, I'll do it. Can you do it, Job? Tread down the wicked in their place. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Though the Lord be high, yet he has respect unto the lowly. And we've read that, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Peter said, likewise, ye younger. Here it is again, submit. Submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject unto one another. All of you be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. So the word is, if, if I, if my. The first part of our part is hum humility. Humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. He will lift us up. And you say, well, how do I do that? If you'll come to get a song. and uh, If anyone wants to pray or. We. Uh, let God be who he is. Complete subordination. I tell you, the, the first thing in humility is just. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Just read his word. Study his word. Let his word dictate your life and not your own desires and your own flesh. If that's the first move we make as a people. And then pray and seek my face. And if we turn from every way that seems to be, that would be wicked. If we turn from if we turn from backbiting, if we turn from judging one another, if we turn from these things that the Lord has told us to turn from, then he said, I hear. I hear from heaven. I mean, he heard Ahab. He heard Manasseh. He heard Josiah. He heard these men that you think, I wouldn't give them a chance. Shoot them. But the Lord's mercy endureth forever, the scripture says. His, his outstretched hand is always there, even to America now. I mean, we surely, surely we must be at a crossroads. 
surely, surely we must be. God has spoken as loud as I've ever heard in my lifetime where we all have to face our own mortality even with this, with this pandemic. We look and see it could hit any one of us. And we think, are we ready? Are we ready for such a thing? As a people and as a nation, how do we respond, O oh Lord? How do we even humble ourselves that we, we could, that God would come once again? If he can change Manasseh's heart, and change Ahab's heart. Surely he can change the heart of America one more time. One more time. It's not too late. I don't think it's too late to you. I don't think it's too late. I'm not going to give up. So I say, oh Lord, if, if, how do I do it? How do I respond if my people? 